Governor Andrew Bailey. Uh, Andrew will now open with some remarks. Well, thanks, Seb, and welcome to the November Monetary Policy Report press conference. Today we've increased bank rate by 0.75 percentage points to 3%. This is the eighth consecutive increase in bank rate since December of last year. We've raised rates by a total of 2.9 percentage points during that period. These are big changes. They have a real impact on people's lives. So why are we doing it? And why are we doing it now when so many people are already struggling with higher energy and food prices and other bills? Well, quite simply, we're increasing bank rate because inflation is too high. And it's the bank's job to bring it down. For a long time, inflation had been low and stable. Most people did not have to worry about inflation, but that has changed. It's changed with supply chain problems after the pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the shrinkage of the UK labour force. Consumer price inflation now stands at over 10%. But I know for many people it will feel worse because the prices of essentials like energy and groceries have risen by much more. People should not have to worry about inflation as they go about their daily business. That's why we've been raising interest rates and did so again today. Low and stable inflation is the bedrock of a stable economy, a predictable economy in which people can go about their lives and plan for their futures with confidence, an economy in which hard-earned money keeps its value. If we do not act forcefully now, it will be worse later on. And as the forecast we are publishing today shows, it is a tough road ahead. The sharp increase in energy prices caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made us poorer as a nation. The level of economic activity is likely to be flat and even fall for some time. But the economy will recover and inflation will fall. We cannot, I'm afraid, pretend to know what will happen to gas prices. That depends on the war in, in Ukraine. But from where we stand now, we think inflation will begin to fall back from the middle of next year probably quite sharply. Now, to make sure that happens, bank rate may have to go up further over the coming months. We can't make promises about future interest rates. But based on where we stand today, we think bank rate will have to go up by less than currently priced in financial markets. And that's important because, for instance, it means that the rates on new fixed-term mortgages should not need to rise as they have done. I want to make some additional points, and there will be some slides coming up, I believe. There we are. To start with, there has been significant volatility in UK financial markets since our last monetary policy report, and indeed our last press conference back at the beginning of August. So the lines in this chart show you the peak level of interest rates expected in financial markets in various economies, and how those expectations have moved around since our last forecast. The expectations for bank rates here in the UK are plotted on the turquoise line. At the time of the August report, the market implied par for bank rate rose to a peak of about 3% in March next year. By the MPC's September policy announcement, which was on the 22nd of September, the peak was 5%, one year ahead. On the 27th of September, five days later, when turmoil in the market was most intense, the path reached its highest peak at nearly 6.5% in November next year. At the market close yesterday, it stood at about 4 and 3 quarter percent and it's currently lower than that now. Given these moves, we have conditioned our November forecast on an average of the market-implied paths over the final seven days of our usual 15-day window. This means that the forecast we present today is conditioned on a path for bank rate that rises to a peak of 5 and a quarter percent during the second quarter of next year. Now, despite the shorter window, this is substantially higher than we had in August. Part of this repricing in UK interest rates reflects global developments. But as this next chart illustrates, there's clearly been a UK-specific component, and you can see that in the light turquoise uh, bars. Indeed, these significant moves in UK yields and in UK financial conditions more broadly 
have occurred in parallel with significant developments in fiscal policy. As we describe in a box in the Monetary Policy Report, the government has announced an energy price guarantee and an energy bill relief scheme. These schemes provide support to households and businesses with their energy bills. Now, the full energy price guarantee will now last for six months. Details are yet to follow on the level of support provided beyond that period. The MPC has therefore adopted a stylized, indicative path for household energy prices in producing the forecast. The working assumption is that the typical household energy bill is halfway between the announced £2,500 limit under the EPG and the level implied by futures prices under the off-gem price cap. The energy support policies are likely to limit significantly further increases in inflation and reduce its volatility, while also supporting spending relative to the August projections. Other fiscal measures announced as of the 17th of October also support demand relative to the August projection. But the, the November forecast does not incorporate any fiscal measures that may be announced at the autumn statement scheduled for the 17th of November. Turning to gas prices, sadly as a consequence of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I've had to talk at length about wholesale gas prices. I think this is the third press conference we've had to do this. Wholesale gas prices continue to be exceptionally volatile. Spot prices have fallen recently, as you can see from the turquoise line in this chart. But medium-term futures prices have been driven higher by Russia's restriction of gas supplies to Europe and concerns about storage uh, over the winter and beyond. Now, you can see that by comparing the orange line for November with the purple line for August. The committee has conditioned its November forecast on the full futures curve for wholesale energy and non-energy commodity prices. And this is a change to the previous convention that wholesale energy prices follow their respective curves for the first six months of the projection only and then remain constant. Uh, to be frank, I would just describe this as a pragmatic choice we had to make. The new conditioning assumption avoids what would otherwise be a pure me purely mechanical jump in the projection for consumer prices, which would be a product of using the former convention beyond the assumed two-year duration of the government's support to retail energy prices. Let me move on to the economic outlook. By comparison with moves in financial markets, the news in the economic data since August has been more modest. Gross domestic product has been weaker than we expected. Labour market data have been stronger. And inflation numbers, while high, have come in about as we expected in August. We keep a close eye on the labour market. There are some signs that labour demand is starting to soften. But the labour market remains tight. The unemployment rate fell to 3.5% in the three months to August, which is the lowest level since 1974. And as you can see in, the next, in this next chart, in the purple bars, the number of unemployed people has now fallen below its pre-COVID level. But a key reason why the labour market has tightened since the pandemic is a marked increase in the number of people who are without a job and who are not actively seeking one. The number of such so-called inactive people has risen again since the August report, as you can see in the blue bars, and by more than projected. And sadly, many of the people who are outside the labour market report that they suffer from long-term sickness. I was going to say a little bit about the forecast uh, looking further forwards. The MPC expects domestic inflationary pressures to remain strong over the next year. But in its central projection, projection which is conditioned on the market-implied path for bank rates that rises to 5.25%, inflation then falls sharply. It reaches 1.4% at the end of the second year, below the 2% target, and it falls to zero at the end of the third year. Contributing to this fall is the purely arithmetic fact that the previous rises in energy prices drop out of the calculations of the annual inflation rate. But in addition, tighter financial conditions and a squeeze on real income slow demand and eventually lead to excess supply and rising unemployment. This downturn in the economy dampens domestic inflationary pressures. 
In the Committee's best collective judgment, GDP will continue to fall throughout next year and into 2024. Compared with previous UK recessions, GDP remains weak relative to its pre-recession level for a prolonged period. You can see that in the yellow line in this chart. There is, I think, however, more to this story. The Committee will not pursue a path that we think will drive inflation far below target. The MPC does not follow the market. It sets the level of bank rate to return inflation to the 2% target sustainably and in a way that avoids undesirable volatility in output. In every monetary policy report, we also publish a projection conditional on a constant level of bank rate, though for the avoidance of any doubt with the clear warning that it does not mean the committee expects to keep bank rate constant either. But that said, comparing outcomes under this alternative conditioning assumption with outcomes in the central projection gives a sense of how different policy decisions may shape the paths for economic activity and inflation. And you can see that with this chart now, with the dashed yellow line that's been added, uh, which is conditioned on a constant level of bank rate at 3%. And you can see that the depth of the recession is much shallower. Not surprisingly, the projected outcomes for inflation are also different. Conditional on a constant rate, consumer price inflation is projected to be a little above rather than below the target at the end of the second year. And let me add a further point before I conclude. Regardless of the path for bank rate, the MPC judges that the risk to its inflation projections are skewed to the upside. In part, the skew reflects the possibility of more persistence in wage and price setting. The upside skew has important implications for monetary policy. Just to put it simply, yes, we project a steep fall in inflation, but there are substantial upside risks to that path. And it's not least for this reason that the majority of the committee judges that further increases in bank rates may be required to return inflation sustainably to target, should the economy evolve broadly in line with the forecast presented in the November monetary policy report. However, the central projections, conditional on the market-implied path of bank rate, serve as a reminder that we should not increase bank rate too far. The MPC judges that the path for bank rate required to return inflation sustainably to target is shallower than that priced into financial markets. There are, however, considerable uncertainties around the outlook. If the outlook suggests more persistent inflation pressures, the committee will respond forcefully as necessary. And with that, Ben, Dave, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we'll wait to questions. Usual process. Uh, grateful if you could wait for the microphones to get to you and state your name and organisation clearly when you start. I'll get through as many as I can. And with that, um, Faisal, then Ed to start. £3,000 when they're facing £3,000 energy bills, rising taxes too, can you, how can you justify that they're going to be paying the price for this? Well, it's a, it's a very good question, Faisal. I want to start by saying that we do understand the difficulties of the situation we're in and the difficulties you know, that, that, that mortgage holders face. What I would say, however, is I would say two things. First of all, if we don't take action to bring inflation down, it gets worse. I've said this before, but I will say it again. You know, there is no easy outcome to this in that sense, and that's important. The second thing I want to say, and of course this applies to people who you know, will be applying for mortgages or will be you know, rolling over uh, fixed-rate mortgages, there's been a lot of commentary, and quite rightly, about what has happened to the mortgage market in the last month or so about what's happened to rates and to availability of mortgages. My central view would be that what we have announced today, both in terms of the rate move, which is fully priced in, was, was fully priced into markets, and the message that you have seen that we've given, I think very clearly, about our view on the market curve, is that therefore this action should not lead to higher mortgage rates. In fact, actually, I think yeah, there, is a, yeah, there is a downside to mortgage rates in that sense in terms of new fixed rate mortgages as we adjust, as we must do, and as markets are doing, 
from the experiences we've had in the last month or so. Now, I fully accept that is more comfort to some people than others, and, and I want to go back to the point I made at the start, which you rightly highlight. This is a difficult time. Quite a lot has happened since the last time you sat here for, for one of these press conferences. We've had uh, three prime ministers, three chancellors, more U-turns than anyone can care to count. Do you have a sense of how much lasting damage has been done to the economy in the last two months for, for households, for businesses, for everyone? Well, I think, you, I, uh, you, I think you have to sort of put a number of sort of lenses on that. It's a very good question. So... As, as, as we've observed, yep, and, and I think the first chart showed it very well, actually, that, I mean, there has been what I would call it a UK premium on rates. So if you look at how UK rates have moved since we were here at the beginning of August compared to the euro area and compared to the US, which that chart did, you'll see they've all gone up. But the UK clearly, you know, clearly went up far, far more, and it went up during this period when there was, of course, you know, considerable turmoil in the markets. Now, the first thing I would say, and the important thing is, that we are seeing that unwind now. I mean, that is substantially unwound. We're substantially back to certainly where we were when we had our last meeting in, in September, which was just before that. Um, and that's obviously a good thing. Market liquidity, though, I think, and Dave may want to come in, is not back to where, where we were. The third thing is, and I think this is, you know, this is an issue that we have to face up to. I was very acutely aware of it when we were in, you know, when we were in Washington recently. Is that, you know, there is, you know, there has been a questioning of UK policy. I use UK policy broadly here. It's not for me to talk about. But I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm just going to talk about policy now. Um, and that will have some lasting effect. And we have to work very hard to, you know, to to, to put that in the past. Frankly, Do you want to say anything about market liquidity, though? All I would add is. We have seen that round tripping uh, back to where rates were on the 22nd of September. That was the day of our last monetary policy uh, meeting. It was the day before the government's mini budget. Um, and so you've seen that, you know, that, for example, the two year OIS, uh, sorry, two year swap rate, which is what two year fixed rate mortgages are priced off. That was 4.5% on the 22nd of September. It peaked at 6%. It's actually come back to slightly below 4.5%. Now it's at 4.38% as of um, a few minutes ago. That obviously hasn't fed through into mortgage, mortgage pricing yet, which was the point Andrew uh, was, was just alluding to. But although we're seeing those kind of round trips, whether there or in the 10-year bond yield, it's clear that markets remain febrile. There's illiquidity across uh, different parts of the market. So I think things have not settled down yet. And, and that's obviously something that we're very focused on in terms of monitoring market conditions. Uh, can I have Jimana and then Chris? Joanna Versace from CNBC. Um, the Fed Chair Jerome Powell yesterday suggested that the bigger risk was one of uh, under-tightening versus over-tightening. I just wonder if you have the same view as well, given even with a 3% constant interest rate, you, you have an inflation forecast of 0.8 percentage points three years out and eight consecutive quarters. Actually, no, with the 3%, it's six consecutive quarters of uh, negative GDP. Thank you. Well, I'll bring Ben in at this point. I mean, I think there are things that we share in terms of our experience and assessment with the Fed, and then there are very diff important differences between what certainly, certainly in the UK, but actually I'd say more Europe more generally are experiencing in terms of shocks from what the US is experiencing. And I, you know, I do think in the commentary and in the discussions, it's important to draw out those distinctions as well. So, Ben, did you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. On that three-year forecast. You've got to remember gas prices are falling quite a lot, so it doesn't give you uh, the straightest picture of sort of underlying inflation um, on that constant rate assumption. But as Andrew says, there's a big, big difference between what's gone on both with inflation and growth uh, between US and Europe. Um, and as Andrew says, it's not always that made that clear. So. The pandemic was a common shock to all of us. The war is not. Uh, the gas prices have gone up 
hugely in Europe, not much at all in the United States. They're still barely 10% in the United States, wholesale gas prices compared with those in Europe. Just as a measure of the difference in growth, I just wrote down before I came up the, the PMI indices, which are a good high frequency and up-to-date measure of growth, at the beginning of the year and what they are now. And at the beginning of the year, they were, all of them in the UK, US, and Europe, very healthy, above trends, coming out of the pandemic. So 54 in the Euro area, 57 in the US, 58 in the UK. Right, the latest readings of 58 in the United States, that's higher than it was just before the war, and they're down at 47 in the UK and Europe. We've got a really, really big difference between the path of growth here, and by here I mean in the continent of Europe versus the United States. You see similar differences now in the composition of inflation. And I think that explains quite a lot of you know, what divergence there is in policy, but also, for example, a part of the strength of the dollar against both the UK and the euro. And it's a, a big difference. You know, pandemic, as I say, was a shock felt by everybody. This one is very differentiated. Chris. Chris Giles from the Financial Times. If I, I'd like to ask a question about the interpretation of the forecast on two grounds, if I, if I may. Um, the inflation forecast is closer to your target on the constant 3% rate assumption than the market path going up to 5.25%. So are, would people be correct in assuming that was closer to where you think the terminal rate should be, somewhere close to where it is today, than going up? And secondly, the forecast is conditioned on fiscal policy not changing on November the 17th, when the Treasury is suggesting a large fiscal tightening of maybe up to 2% of GDP. How would that change the inflation forecast? Well, I'll start. I mean, so, so Ben and Dave may want to come in. I mean, I'll do it in reverse order, if you don't mind, Chris. I mean, I think the, the, answer, the answer to your second question, of course, is that we will... Uh, we, always, we always condition on announced fiscal policy. Now, as I explained in the introductory remarks, we've had to sort of think quite hard about, in the context of the energy side, what the word announced means and put what I think is a sort of stylized but sensible interpretation on it. But um, on, on the other measures, which, as I said quite explicitly, they, they do not appear in the forecast, we will, of course, take those into account uh, when we next meet and then in our next forecast, as, as we always would do. And, and we'll see what the Chancellor announces. I think I, my answer to a really, really interesting question on, the, on your first part to your question is uh, the, the last chart we put, I put up, well, we put up, where, which had the sort of, you, you could see the difference between the two, the two parts, if you like, in GDP terms. Um, and and as you, you rightly say, you, you, can, you can use a similar inflation chart. Um, I would just emphasize the point that there is an, an upside risk on inflation. And it actually is, in, in MPC history, it's, a, it's one, maybe the largest, actually, upside risk uh, in, MC, MPC, in MPC history. And that reflects, certainly, the, the labor market. Um, you know, there obviously are issues around, uh, around, around gas prices, sadly, as well. So we're not, we're very clearly not saying, you know, uh, we're not putting our sort of, you know, our bet either way in terms of which is the better curve. But it's important that since we do think the market curve is too high, that I think it's useful as a sort of guideline to show, and not show where the alternative is. But where, you know, obviously where the truth will lie in between the two, it's, we're not giving guidance on that because, you know, we don't predict market paths precisely. Dave, you want yeah, to? Yeah, just to add to what Andrew said. So... We've got this historically large skew on the inflation fan chart, which is our way of quantifying that upside risk on inflation. And I think you know, that reflects the factors that we've been focusing on more and more through this year, which is concerns around persistence of inflation from domestically generated inflation. That could be because of um, the tightness of the labour market, but equally also from firms um, looking at an environment where they think they can um, put up prices. And those kind of uh, inflation drivers carry with them the risk of being more persistent. Uh, hence, you know, the, the communication that we gave, that the majority of us, uh, assuming that projections broadly follow... Uh, the, the numbers that we've just published think that we'll have to make further increases 
in bank rate um, to get inflation sustainably back to target. And to your other point, I wouldn't be thinking in terms of you know, looking at those two constant rate or current rate paths uh, to work out where we think the, the neutral uh, rate is. That's not something we are focusing on. What we are focusing on is where we think interest rates have to go in the meantime. That's the focus and that's of our communications. I think ben to yeah, just one tiny thing. Obviously, the fiscal announcement coming. What matters for us is the effects of fiscal policy in our forecast horizon. And the government's planning horizon may be slightly longer than that. Lucy and then Ashley, please. Lucy White from the Daily Mail. Um, Governor, you said in your opening remarks, um, you know, fixed term mortgages should not need to rise as they have done. Um, you've addressed that. Um, what would you say to the lenders who have been, you know, putting their rates up in, um, in recent weeks? And what would you say, you know, in terms of responsible lending for the future? And what would you say um, to you know, the consumers who have had to lock in over the last few weeks, either, you know, because they thought the picture yeah. was going to get worse or because, you know, it just, it was the time. Well, it's a no, very good question. Um, well, I start by saying that because the, the mortgage market in this country over the last decade or so has moved quite substantially from being a variable rate market to a fixed rate market. Not, of course, fi fixed rates in the sense that the U.S. knows in terms of duration, but nonetheless uh, much more of a fixed rate market than a variable rate market. Now, Fixed mortgage rates are priced off the market curve because of the swap because there's a swap there's a swap involved in there for the lending institution. Uh, so that whereas variable rate mortgages traditionally are priced far more off you know, off our rate, if you like, and, and as it moves, fixed rate mortgages are priced far more off the market curve. Now that, the reason I say that that's important, of course, is that as we saw and if we've illustrated what and, and said, as we saw this real you know. Blow, out, blow up of, uh, of, of the market curve as it happened, um, that obviously had an impact on pricing mortgages. Um, I think it also, to, Dave was making this point as well, it also made uh, lenders you know, pretty uncertain, of course, about what, about what they were facing in terms of making offers which would last for however long. And I think that explains two things that you point to. One is the, the, the increase in, in, in new fixed mortgage rates, and secondly, the withdrawal of offers from the market. Now, it follows, from, I, I hope, I, I, would, I would suggest from what we've said, that that is now calm, you know, it's calming down. The curve is coming down. So pricing off the curve you know, is, is getting more predictable, I think. Uh, and the curve itself is, is coming down. And that should be reflected through, as, as many commentators, and I know quite a few of you have said in you know, in what you've written in recent days and in the last week or so, that should be reflected through into mortgage rates. I mean, that's, you know, these things have to be symmetric in that sense. So that's, that would be my, you know, my view of how it should evolve. I'm not going to give predictions of precise mortgage rates. That's not, not, not something I think that's our job. But, but I would expect that, that pattern to be reflected through. And so, therefore, I think um, people who are, you know, now in the process of going for new fixed rate mortgages or rolling over should, should obviously get, uh, get those terms. I, I, to, to your point, though, of course, it is, I think it is very unfortunate that those who've had to, had to take mortgages out during this period have faced a much more difficult uh, situation. And if I, I mean, just the facts of that, we will be publishing numbers tomorrow that we cover in the, in the minutes, but the quoted rate on a two-year fixed rate, 75% loan-to-value mortgage, 6% um, in October, which is its highest since 2008, whereas it was 3.6% in August, 4.2% in September. So it's clearly, you know, the spread on mortgages, which was quite compressed, has opened up a lot, and there is a lag, so it will take time for mortgage pricing to reflect that, but you know, we will we will wait to see how mortgage pricing does reflect the fact that the reference cur the the reference rates that I was giving you earlier have come down a lot from those equivalent peaks. I mean, what was striking was that the pricing the pass through was very quick on the way up. So it gets back to Andrew's point about you know looking to see how quick it is on the way down. Uh, Ashley, uh, Ashley from the 
Sun. Uh, two, if I may. Uh, you mentioned the UK premium. Um, it has been called Reader Things, but let's call it uh, the mini budget premium as well. I mean, how much would you think that interest rates and inflation, um, sorry, interest rates would have to rise if there hadn't been this instability in the gilt market that we, we saw and, um, and, and kind of that knock-on effect? Like, how much is that having an impa impact on this? And the second point would be, given that we are going to go through what you're predicting, a two-year-long recession, the longest since we've had since the 1920s, do you not think that adding to the household pain of adding interest rates at that time, we're already seeing that the economy is slowing, we're already seeing these indicators, why should we be kind of having that higher interest rates during this painful period as well? Well, let me start. I, it really isn't possible to do what I call a sort of counterfactual interest rate, you know, counterfactual MPC decision. What would we have decided had none of the sort of the, the events of the last sort of couple of months actually happened? Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I did say earlier that, you know, there has been re relatively much less economic news, but I mean, there's, but the, I would, however, emphasize that the, the components of the sort of the, of the risk that we, the upside risk that we see to inflation uh, towards the end of the forecast are really related to the labor market. Uh, uh, so, so sad, sadly, some of it too, I suspect, gas prices as well. And those things are not, of course, to do with uh, to do with what's happened in the last few months. So, so, so I, you know, I, I, I would sort of really only draw those points out. It's not possible for us to do what I sort of say counterfactual MPC in that sense. On your point about the recession, um, I'd really go back to I think a point I made to, made to, to Faisal uh, in his question, which is. The fact of the matter is that if we don't tackle the inflation, then the problem gets worse. Um, and and that, would, that would rebound onto, frankly, the, both the duration and the nature of the recession, I think. I'll just have one thing, a word of caution on the duration. If you look at the, for what it's worth, the central projection that the quarterly numbers as you get into the second year of the downturn, they're very small. Right? And in particular, they're very small compared with the kind of standard error around this. It really wouldn't take much either to lengthen or shorten that duration considerably. The important thing for us is you know, what is likely to be the increase in spare capacity required to ensure that domestic inflation returns sustainably to target. And after allowing for the negative effects on demand of the very same shocks that have pushed up inflation, energy, pandemic, and so forth, how much more is there left for us to do? And it's, it's in the nature of the extraordinary sequence of difficult shocks the economy has faced that at the same time it's pushed up inflation and yet depressed growth. And unfortunately, as Andrew said, I mean, it's very important that we do our job and make sure that that inflation does not persist for longer than it should. Uh, but as far as the duration, as I say, the projected duration is concerned, I mean, I, I wouldn't be that confident about the precise number of quarters, frankly, given the shape of what we're forecasting. It's quite flat as you get to the end of the downturn. Uh, Larry, then Zoo, please. Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Um, the bank is saying that we're about to have a two-year recession Two members of the committee didn't vote for a 75-point increase. You're saying that on constant rate assumptions, inflation would be quite close to its target in two years' time. I know you're not saying where you think rates are going to peak, but couldn't people be forgiven for thinking that rates are going to peak closer to 3% than the 4.6% currently being anticipated by the markets? Isn't that the message that you're actually trying to send out here? Well, I mean, I, I, by the way, I mean, I think you were saying this, Larry, but just just to be absolutely clear, of course, the constant rate assumption is is post the, the increase. It's, it's a three percent constant rate in that sense. Just to be clear, I mean, you'll, you'll probably criticise me for stating the blindingly obvious at this point, but I mean, in, in a sense, what we're saying, we are saying, is that you know, our sort of you know, our best uh, view of what the rate should be, given the situation, circumstances, and the evidence we have to date. Is, uh, is is nearer to the constant rate curve 
uh, than the market curve is to the constant rate curve currently. Now, that's, as you say, thank you for that statement, the blindingly obvious, I think you'll probably say at this point. Um, but just to reiterate, I mean, we do not have a, a, you know, a precise alternative path because yeah, the reason I have to somewhat labour in my opening remarks, the conditioning assumptions, is that we've made more changes to the conditioning assumption this time out of necessity than probably we ever have before, actually, because you know, things have happened. Um, but those conditioning assumptions are, of course, an important part of determining sort of the outcome in terms of where the forecast takes you to. We can then apply sort of our judgment over that, which we have done. But our judgment doesn't, you know, doesn't lead us to a precise number in that sense. Can I just be clear on another factual point, which is that the conditioning path for the market rate f based forecast has w was an OIS curve with a peak in bank rate of five and a quarter. So not, not the current level of bank rate. It's the, you know, the, the seven days was f implied a peak bank rate of five and a quarter. Yeah, I mean, we have to cut off so that we can actually produce the report. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a sign of the times that the curve has moved quite a bit since we actually cut off. That's it. Just to follow on from what you guys have just said, why have you decided so explicitly to push back against those market rate expectations? And I know you just said um, that inflation risks remain skewed to the upside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Ben developed this thought in his speech the other day, so I'm going to let Ben develop it some more. Yeah. <laughs> um, if there is, I mean, the thing is, I hope it's reasonably clear in the minutes. We think that it's likely, given this forecast, that further rate rises will be necessary. But if you think of that comparison that Andrew began with between what the market was expecting at the time of the August report, without commenting on whether either is precisely right or wrong, but the, the scale of the move in the predicted peak over the following two months was enormous. So it's perfectly possible, and this is where we are, to say we think further rises will be uh, likely to have to occur, but that we also think they're not likely to have to go as high as five and a quarter percent, given everything else in the forecast. I mean, but both those statements are true. And the point about forceful is veering more towards a conditional statement that's very important that we always make, that what actually happens will depend on the shocks that actually hit the economy. And the thing to take away, I think, is not so much that we, we have some predict, you know, particular value of interest rates that we're telling people we're going to go to, we will do whatever is necessary to ensure that our projections of medium-term inflation are close, sustainably close to target. And this, on this particular forecast, it suggests that, A, uh, we don't think it wouldn't be, if the things turn out like the forecast, necessary to go to five and a quarter, but yes, further rate rises are likely to be necessary. So both those things are true. Thanks, Phil, then uh, Marie. Thanks. Um, Phil Aldrich at Bloomberg. Um, can I just get a point clarified to begin with? Because you talk about uh, the correct path of rate rises doesn't need to be what has been priced into financial markets. You've, you mentioned 5.25% peak and you mentioned 4.75% peak in the, in the documents in, in different places. So are both of those market paths too high or are you being specific about a single one? So just a point of clarity. Um, and uh, what, uh, in, the, in the sort of newfound spirit of clarification, um, of, of collaboration between uh, fiscal and monetary policy. I'm just wondering if you've got any ideas about what measures might help the bank hit its inflation targets, more fiscal tightening, and, and, and particularly with, uh, with regard to the um, uh, job shortages, if there's anything uh, that could ease job shortages, just those kind of policy measures. Well, well, uh, I'll do the second. Dave may want to do, do the first, I think. I'll, I'll do the second. I mean, sort of a nice try to get me to sort of um, lecture the government on what its policy should be, but it really is for the government. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think our, you know, our report lays out the situation. It, it, it lays out the, the, the issues that the economy faces. You're right, and it's why I made the point, that I think in, in everything that's been going on recently, 
we should not get away from the fact that there's a real issue in terms of the size of the labour force in this country, which has shrunk. Uh, but it's not for me to prescribe what government, or even suggest what government policy should be. Just on, just to set out as, as, as clearly as, as we can, I, I mean, I think it is set out in Paris 16 of the minutes. The MPC's projections were conditioned on the path of bank rate implied by financial markets in the seven working days leading up to 25th of October. That, that path was rising to a peak of five and a quarter percent in 2023 Q3. So all the forecast numbers based on the market path, that's where the five and a quarter comes from. We then just report that, in, and this goes to my point that markets remain febrile, even these pretty liquid markets, that in the run up to our November decision yesterday, the peak had come down to four and three quarter. But the conditioning path is the five and a quarter. Thanks. Hi, uh, Mehreen from The Times. Just on, on what happened today, given that inflation is still in line with your August forecast, the fact that we've had a financial tightening and that we can expect uh, fiscal consolidation, is the reason that you opted for 75 today because it was priced in by the market and not delivering that would have produce maybe more volatility than you would have liked in this febrile environment? And is it fair to say that we're not going to be seeing 75 moving forward? And another question, the Fed yesterday stressed that it is now thinking about the cumulative impact that its rate rises are having um, on inflation. Are you also going to be start thinking about all of the action you've done so far and the sort of variable lag that's now going to have on the economy and inflation going forward? I, I was tempted to say the answer to those are no and yes. No in the sense that we, yeah. we do not um, follow the market. Um, you know, we obviously condition on the market path of the forecast. But I would draw a distinction between the forecast and our judgment on the policy decision. And you can see that from obviously from the way we've described our, you know, our thinking on that and our, our thinking on the, uh, the, the forecast path conditioned by the market. So, no, we don't, uh, you know, we don't follow the market. And, you know, we are prepared as uh, <laughs> you can probably you can probably recount from the past there are times when we're prepared to you know to, to diverge from the market path and accept that that would obviously lead to some repricing so um you know i think that's 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 a very important one did you want to come on well only to, to make very clear because i hope it's clear in the minutes what led to this decision now various we're always looking at all the data we saw upside surprises in wages and in activity and that's been a key area of focus for the second round effects of higher food and energy and other imported goods prices. That's been important for a while, and we saw another upside surprise in that. And we don't know yet what's going to happen with fiscal policy, and in particular, following Chris's question, fiscal policy in the relatively near term, which is what affects our forecast. What we do know is that the energy price package will be a significant support to demand relative to the August forecast. And each of those two things justifies tighter policy. And we are always led, taking account of what we've already done, to link it to your second question, to think about you know, what is the right level of interest rates and the right path to hit the inflation target. We do not just simply reflect back what the market already thinks. I mean, it's their job to follow us, not ours to follow them. And, and just on this point about... Do we take account of what's already happened? I mean, as Andrew set out in his opening remarks, we've been, this is the eighth consecutive meeting that we've put up rates. So every meeting since December 2021, when rates were at 0.1, we've been raising rates by a cumulative now 2.9%. And we are very conscious of that, that that cumulative impact is feeding through onto the economy and is is adding to the challenges that households and businesses are facing. So I think we've been pretty consistent in flagging that cumulative effect. And I just, I just, on your second question, I just emphasise that point because one of the things obviously we do spend quite a lot of time on is the transmission of monetary policy. So how each of our decisions transmits into, uh, into outcomes. And um, you know, we are obviously as we approach the anniversary of the, of the first interest rate rise, and given you know, what we know about the transmission mechanism, yes, of course, that, the, the impact of the transmission of our earlier decisions is, is obviously a factor in our consideration. 
Um, and of course, we also, by the way, have to consider, going back to the question on mortgages, of course, we also have to consider how the transmission mechanism changes and adapts over time as aspects of the economy and the aspects of the, of the financial system change. Thanks. Uh, Isha? lag in monetary policy, when do you expect today's rate to be felt um, on, your, on your inflation, you know, inflation in the country? Like, when will people expect to experience that? And are you waiting to see evidence of inflation going down in domestic price pressures as well as those global factors before you think about slowing down or even ending this current hiking cycle? Uh, to you, um, <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question. Yeah. Um, we're focused, as always, I mean, one of the reasons we use the forecast both to think about policy and describe it uh, is because we're because of the lags that you discuss. And I'm not trying to uh, um, suggest that there are very precise estimates, but typically you might expect a peak effect of an interest rate change on demand, you know, a year or maybe a little bit less an inflation, say, 18 to 24 months, or maybe maybe longer than that under some circumstances. So it's because of those lags, indeed, that we have a forecast in the first place. What will determine how long this goes on for should be seen much more in the context of that forecast, which depends on lots of things and lots of indicators rather than any single one. We have stressed the domestic labour market as one key indicator of domestic inflationary pressure. Um, but I wouldn't want to pick up one single indicator even within that, frankly. Um, but it's more, as I say, to do with our assessment of medium-term inflation. And there are lots of things that go into that forecast, rather than the current rate of inflation. And precisely because of the lags you talk about. And I'm not going to say that means, you know, the interest rates will either stop going up at this particular point or peak at this particular level. We don't know yet but it's a slightly broader framing uh, that we consider rather than any specific <coughs> indicator. Uh, Jack, please, and then Francis. <coughs> um, Jack Barnett from the City AM. Um, on both of these projections you've got on the, co um, the constant rate and the market rate, I mean, they're, they're pretty bleak on both sides. I mean, are you essentially saying that <coughs> this path to the so-called soft landing is now kind of dead? Um, you know, we're not going to avoid this recession. We actually might even need this recession to push down inflation to complement rising um, bank rate. And then just secondly, you obviously mentioned there that we're approaching <coughs> um, the year anniversary when we uh, first raised interest rates. Just uh, kind of taking, taking a step back from maybe all of you, I mean, how how sharp has the swing been in the economy's performance when we were going into that meeting to now? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let me start by saying, um, I think when we look at the path of the recession, it's worth bearing in mind always the sheer size of the, of the shock that we have experienced to real income in this country call it terms of trade shock, if you like, uh, from events, and particularly, obviously, during the course of this year, from events surrounding Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, this is a huge shock. You know, it's very interesting. I, know, you know, I think Ben has said in the past that if you compare this to the 1970s, and you compare this year to single years in the 1970s, and obviously government policies also come into play there in terms of energy markets, this is a bigger shock than we saw in a year in the 1970s. So while I don't for a moment want to sort of you know, wring my hands and say a recession is inevitable, when you look at those paths, you have to look at them in the context of the shock that the economy is experiencing. And sadly, of course, the people of this country are experiencing. So I would put it into that context. Yeah, we, were, we were never, I mean, you say we're now not saying it's a soft landing. We were forecasting recession in August, if you mm -hmm. remember. This is not the first time we've yeah. forecast a recession. And as Andrew emphasizes, the different, I mean, soft landing is often used to describe the aims of policy tightening in the United States 
and I emphasize the question, answer the question I gave earlier, we're in a very, very different position. Because on its own, the rises in import prices of goods, of food, of energy, will depress growth here. We then have to decide, regrettably, how much more do we have to do to ensure that the combined pressure of those real income hits and uh, monetary tightening bring inflation back to target. But I don't think we've ever said we're aiming for a soft land. We're aiming to bring inflation back to target. That's what we're aiming to do. And uh, it's been a feature of the forecast for a long time because of the nature of this shock that growth, our forecast for growth have got progressively weaker. And as I say, we had a forecast recession in August. And you ask about the turnaround, this time last year, before energy prices really started rising, the forecast had, the central forecast, I think, was for GDP growth of the following, over the following year, so to the fourth quarter of this year, of almost 3%. And it's now 0.2. That's already happened. That's, that's a, a measure of the scale, not so much of the tightening in interest rates because of those lags, but the, the direct effect of the huge rise in import prices, particularly energy. It's also, I must say, Simon, it's interesting just to recall a year, you know, this time a year ago when we were sitting here a year ago, and the issue we were wrestling with, and of course, I remember the decision we took at that meeting was, you know, it was, attracted a lot of commentary, let me, let me put it that way, but the issue we were wrestling with then was the, really in my view, was the labour market and the, what, what was the impact at the end of the furlough scheme on the labour market, and you know, that remains an important issue in, in, the, in the sense that the labour market remains important and the whole question of the, you know, the tightness of the labour market remains important. Uh, and I think we, like other forecasters, were, you know, were you know, surprised, I'll say this, that the ending of the furlough scheme didn't lead to any loosening of the labour market, any, any really marked and certainly prolonged rise in unemployment. But I say it also because, just to recall, I mean, it is interesting to put into context just how many major events have happened in the intervening period. I mean, it is, you know, it, it, is, it is pretty striking. You know, we go back to a year ago, what, you know, what, what the issues were a year ago, and then everything that has happened subsequently. Uh, Francine. Francine Lacqua, Bloomberg TV. Um, Governor, now that you've started QT, do you have any estimate on how much tightening that will impart? Sorry, how much on, Q, on QT, now that you've QT. started QT, how much tightening I'll, does that impart? I'll hand over to the uh, resident QT expert. On <laughs> <laughs> um, I will, I'll differentiate the, the answer from the, the one I gave uh, previously. I mean, we, we've always thought of QT as being very different from QE in the sense that when we were doing QE, we were trying to send a signal about what was going to happen to bank rate. That's clearly not the case with QT. And also, we quite often did QE at times when markets were, were really not functioning well, and th those episodes tended to be when Q QE had its most significant effect, which is why we talk about QE being state contingent. QT is also state contingent, but we've made clear, the MPC has made clear that it would not do QT under um, issues of market dysfunction. We, were, we, did pour, we did pause the start of our active guilt sales by a few weeks because of what we were seeing particularly at the long end uh, of the government bond market back at the end of September. So we paused from, we were planning to start in early October. We didn't start until Tuesday when we did our first auction and carried that off successfully. Um, you know, 750 million proceeds, one of eight auctions we're going to do uh, in the remainder of this year um, a total of around six billion. And, and I guess the final point I'd make is we, throughout our, the way we've planned our QT program, going back to last August, we've tried to be deliberate. We've tried to be, we've always said that we would do this in as predictable a way as possible. And that means it should be priced into markets uh, as and when we do it. So it's impossible to extract you know, what was the exact effect either of the total programme that the MPC has set out, which is 80 billion over a year, 
or of any particular auction. If I could just add, I mean, just on the state contingent point, is that I think there is also, certainly in the current context, another piece of state contingency, which is that, you know, as, as quite a few market commentators will tell you, and a number of you have written, I know, there is currently quite a, quite a wedge between uh, the unsecured rate and, uh, and, and secured sort of, you know, GC collateral rates uh, in the repo market. And that, of course, is relevant to, 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 you know, to us selling assets into the market in many ways. I mean, people are saying to us there's a shortage of collateral in the market yeah. at the moment. So in a state contingency sense of the immediate context, that's, that's relevant. And actually, to your question, Francine, that would suggest that you know, it, it, our sales are not going to have that much impact in that sense, uh, cumulatively. And indeed, is why we... we, yeah. when, we in, when we published uh, the revised plans for the sales... We deliberately skewed the sales to the short and medium buckets so that we can support the market yep. by providing collateral and equally given, you know, still concerns potentially at the long end, we thought it was, you know, we can start selling our, from the longer end of our holdings uh, in the new year. Thanks. Uh, David. Uh, David Millican from Reuters. Um, just on a point of clarification, um, sort of Governor, when you were sort of talking about the sort of likely path for rates being sort of likely to be closer to a constant path than a market rate path, were you talking no. about sort of the market yeah. rate no, path? I didn't, say, I, just, I didn't say that. No, no, no. What I said was um, that it would be, it, if you think about the, the gap between the, the market path we have uh, in the forecast and the constant rate path, I said that you know the, our commentary would suggest that the path would be nearer to the constant rate path than the market uh, rate path in the forecast, and you know, and I'll repeat the apology I made to Larry. That's a statement to the blind in the obvious. There's nothing, yeah. There's nothing more than that. It imagine. amounts to saying simply that we thought we wouldn't have to get as yeah. high as the market yeah. curve given the forecast yeah. we had. Yeah. So. Uh, and sorry, just to finish uh, finish that part of sure, the question. Sure. So it was that sort of. Were you talking about the sort of market rate path as it was at the time of the sort of forecast when they were set, or the market rate path as it is today? Yeah, and the market rate path today is lower. I mean, as, as I was saying earlier, that's an interesting sort of feature of the times we live in. That although not that much time has elapsed since we came to the end of the window for the for the forecast, actually it's moved quite a bit since then, and it's moved downwards. But as I said, we're not giving uh, you know we, we it's, it's not we're not giving a sort of you know here's our line. That's not what we do. So <laughs> I'm not going to comment on sort of you know how much is today's curve you know in the right place relative to you we know what it was a week ago. Yeah. You know, we've done one. The statement yeah. is about the market path at the time and underlying, at the time of and underlying a forecast we've just published, not what it is minute by minute. Uh, and sort of more broadly, do you feel the sense that you're sort of flying blind a little bit with still a huge amount of sort of uncertainty about sort of government fiscal policy and what exactly is going to be sort of coming up, sort of how much tightening we're likely to be getting? Well, I'll go back to, to what I said earlier. Um, we moved, you know, we moved on from what you might call a sort of the, the long-established definition of announced in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of the energy package, because, you know, if, if, if I can sort of, I think I can describe what the Chancellor has said. If you think about two bookends, oh, this is what happens after April, obviously, what, what happens between now and April is, is, is set. If you think about two bookends, one of which is uh, that there is no package off, there is no household support after April. The other which is, is that the full package remains in place. I think, I think it's clear that the Chancellor has said that neither of those are things that he intends to pursue. So it would obviously not be sensible for us to condition on those two and therefore I think it was, it was, it was required and natural that we had to make an assumption that fell somewhere between the two. But it's, a, it's frankly it's a stylized assumption. It's not, it's not in any sense us saying well we know what's going to happen because we don't actually in that sense. Um, and then on the rest of fiscal policy, we have followed our normal practice that if it isn't announced, it isn't in there, as it were. So whatever else the Chancellor's going to say at the fiscal statement that's going to come up, um, that, is, that does not feature in our forecast because it is not government policy as, as of now. Uh, we're in last question, and I think uh, Lucy. Lucy Hager, Market News. 
The bank's projections show unemployment rising to 6.5% in three years' time. Does the bank see this as more of a normalization in unemployment levels or is it of concern? And as far as unemployment goes, do you see the risks as being more skewed to the upside or downside? Well, I, I'm sure Ben Dave wants to come on this. I, if you talk about the term neutralize, uh, normalization, um, you can interpret that in a number of ways, it seems to me. Is it normalization relative to history? Um, well, I don't think our, you know, our job is not to normalize relative to some point in the past, because that, you know, that's not the context we face now. Now, of course, another way of expressing this question is to go to the concept of a neutral rate or the concept of, of, of R star, as it's often called. And, you know, sort of speaking to myself here, I, you know, I think there are two parts to that story. One is what you might call the shorter run cyclical element of it, and then the other one is the longer run structural element, which I sort of which I did make a speech on earlier in the summer and with some colleagues uh, have published a paper on, although I have to say they did most of the work and I didn't. But, uh, so they get the credit and I get the, I get the blame. Um, on the, on the, the longer run, which is entirely fair, uh, on the longer run point, on the sort of more structural point, what I would say, and that's the conclusion of the work that we did publish, is that you know, the longer and these are global drivers, they're not UK specific, and the more cyclical thing you can talk in somewhat more in UK terms. On the longer run issues, what did I say? Uh, academic. An, ac an academic is ringing, calling, yes. Um, on the longer run point, I think, you know, the point we did make in, in that paper, in that speech, was that the longer run global drivers are very slow moving structural drivers, particularly aging, population aging, which is obviously a global feature. And it's hard to see that those things have sort of, you know, have run their course, as it were, at the moment, and particularly played through. So the conclusion we drew from that was that um, we, we didn't see that as being a long-run, uh, you know, change in, in, the, in that sort of context, context of the neutral rate or R star going upwards. I think the, the more cyclical element, of course, yes, I think you can see some upward movement in it for, for reasons that sort of, in a sense, underlie what we've published today. Do you want to add no, no. I mean, on, on unemployment, what it's worth, there's also a natural rate estimate we have of that, and uh, six and a half is very clearly above that. And, of course, any rise is regrettable, whether you think it's coming from below or coming from above that natural rate, but it's, you know, the complement to a recession. This is what tends to happen. And we've discussed at length uh, the underlying causes of that recession and that um, downturn. The risks, I think, both on, on, on all the real side of the forecast, I think Dave will correct me if I'm wrong, GDP and unemployment are balanced. They're neither skewed in one direction yeah. or the other. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much.